I have the honor of um, being the presenter today and good afternoon to everyone who would be attending this session or would be watching it on YouTube or on our website in the future. We hope that it will help with some of the understandings and some of the concepts that revolve around this month and we hope that we make it our job every month to be aware of what is going on around this issue topic. So I wanted to just give you my understanding and participation in Women on the Move Board of Directors and what we do to inspire our audience, who are mostly young women, young girls, and women of all ages. And this is what we hope to do, to educate, to inspire, and to empower. And going throughout this workshop and this presentation, I would like to um, give some input as to each one of those components. And then, of course, it's up to us individually to start our own journey of self-exploration, education, inspiration, and empowerment. I'm just hoping that we would start on that path if we have not already and become part of that movement. As far as giving you a little bit of history on this, there are so many websites and on the web, the wealth of information, availability of resources, videos, um, films, uh, information, historical landmarks, legal discussions, you name it, it's available. I just wanted to give a very brief review of this long path on this journey that women have come uh, for the past 2,000 years. We've faced the issue of violence against women. However, uh, it is really in the last 150 years where some movement had started and then some serious conversation in the last 70 years. So I wanted to direct our attention to a website that has all of this information in a very detailed way. And it is the Center for Women, Peace and Security. And it, it really walks us through the years, the landmark years. And it's basically the, the cluster of years that have made impact in the lives of women starting with 1791 and starting with Mary Wollstonecraft and the book that she wrote about a vindication of rights of women. And it was prompted by a French author who had started writing about the rights of men. And she felt obligated and prompted to write, to write something about the rights of women. Then it took, as you know, about 140, 150 years for the next serious movement, even though there was some, uh, some movement by uh, uh, philosophers, by uh, thinkers, by people who, who wanted to be looking at human rights issues, but they all fell short when it came to rights of women by differentiating between women and men. And not allowing women to have the full benefit of the human rights uh, thinking and application and benefits because they consider women either with less of morality or with less capabilities or with less mental capacity. And with that distinction, uh, it took a long time to really overcome some of the biases and some of the norms that were based on power the control of power in the societies, whether the power is by wealth, um, by ownership of property, by force uh, and the physical force. So the first time that really securing some legal foundation uh, was discussed was the UN Charter, which started in 1945. And then all those years into the 60s, you see that there are some movement towards the progressive uh, understanding of women's rights. And then the period of the 60s to 70s was really recognizing how women could have a role in places of decision making. And again, it was the United Nations that started creating an area of status of women as opposed to just looking at it as part of the human rights uh, issues. 
And then between 75 and 85, for that decade following, it was mostly the, the decade about women, and there is a typo there, but the first World Congress on Women in 1975. And then for the decade following that, most of the movements were towards bringing equality, the understanding of justice, the understanding of um, doing something towards development of the community so that it moves towards peace, moving away from violence. And for the first time, experts are getting together, talking about what are the causes of violence and how is it that we're addressing that. Then after 1995 to today, uh, and that coincides with the time where the uh, Violence Against Women Act was first introduced and put in effect, and then every um, several years it was renewed as if it's something that may no longer be necessary for the laws to be helping women uh, in that area. So it hasn't become the permanent laws. It had not become the permanent laws, and it was to be renewed. And, and we've seen that that has happened to help women to have the protection of the laws, even though we all will see that eventually the laws alone are not enough to get this movement to where it should go to, because it's the norm of the culture and the religion and the traditional social um, acceptable behaviors is what has given rise to these um, deep-rooted prejudices and embedded concepts that there is an there is a, uh, inferiority of women and a superiority of men. So it was, uh, let's just go to the next slide and see if there was, a, there was a case that brought the concept of violence against, and it's Aydin versus Turkey, which is for the very first time the, the war crime of torture are now including, after the decision in that case, 1994, as late as that, um, a girl who was subjected to repeated uh, acts of violence and sexual violence and rape uh, was brought to court um, for the claims that she had that, that had to distinguish what she had been subjected to from the acts of torture that her family were subjected to by the invasion of her country by uh, the troops. So for the first time, they were looking at uh, issues in, in, light, in a different light. And for the first time, the court recognized that repeated hours and hours and days and days of torture mixed with rape after some experts finally decided that her virginity was lost through the acts of rape and not due to other reasons that they finally decided that a rape in that scenario does constitute torture. And then we see that series of um, case law and, and decisions by the courts that starts looking at the issue of torture uh, as it relates to women, which is different than when, when others are subjected to it. For women, it has a different meaning. Not only it's more traumatic um, at the time that it happens, but it has lingering effects for, for decades and decades throughout the life of that woman, and it disables that individual from, from participating in the society in the first instance that is intended um, to be. So the facts that, that we know today, and this is right hot off the press, and this is from World Health Organization, WHO, WHO, and as of September of 2020, these studies have these numbers, and I wanted to make sure that this information is shared. However, since we might um, produce these documents on our website, I don't think there is uh, a point for me to go through every single one of them. But it is almost common knowledge that one third, which means one of every three women worldwide, have experienced or will experience physical or sexual intimate partner violence or through their um, relationship with a non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. And these are often done by the intimate 
um, partner uh, of the women and it is some form of physical or sexual and that it has the negative effects that are not only physical, mental, and it affects the reproductive health. As a matter of fact, it was the cost of health of addressing, I'm going to let another individual into the room. It was the expense and the cost, the overwhelming cost of treating women for their injuries as a result of sexual violence or violence by partner or non-partner that caused Center for Disease Control, the CDC, we hear that name often these days due to the pandemic and their statements and their credibility is known worldwide. But it wasn't until CDC brought it up, the issue of violence against women, as a concern, as a health concern, that the rulers and the lawmakers started to think, in, to think about it in a serious way as to what do we do to try to eliminate the root causes of that. And as the key facts, it is identified now by who, again, the World Health Organization, that these um, physical violences are more likely to be perpetrated when there is low level of education, and this applies across the world to, to men and women who have been subjected to maltreatment or exposure to violence during their childhood years. And then for men, it's a sense of entitlement. And for women, is an attitude of accepting the unfounded norms of the culture and, and social um, behaviors and the religion that male privilege has to exist and the women have to be subordinate to men. And those we can talk about a little bit more as to the historical basis for passivity and the, of women and the aggression of men. Then they are presenting evidence to the world. This is a world organization that counseling interventions, empowering women, advocacy for, for women, providing those resources for women, as well as visitation, home visits for women are promising measures of either preventing and or reducing this very huge ill in our society. And they are, of course, attributing the conflict and displacement as exacerbating the situations. If there is existing violence, of course, um, the, the poverty uh, issues affected, the um, abuse of drug and alcohol is, is aggravating it. And those are the items that are identified now, and it would be um, would be ways of, of prevention as well as uh, cure. Then there are the patterns of behavior. We talked about the patterns of behavior that are accepted in a culture or, a, or through the um, social acceptance based on the laws of religion or based on the laws of, of the community. So when United Nations made a call based on focus on the status of women uh, to be the subject to be discussed, one of the organizations that came up with uh, solutions and statements and calling the world's attention to the issue was the Baha'i international community. It's a faith-based community. It's, it's a faith community, but so much of the faith-based social action, public discourse, engagement, and um, progressive movements have been built around that, that I'm going to be referring to some of their statements throughout this presentation because it's one of the newer religions in the world and it, it has mandates and workable practical blueprints on how to get to the root of some of these issues and be able to address and deal with that. So the patterns of behavior that are discussed in this document that was presented to the first, um, the, the first time it was the 51st session of the UN Commission on Human Rights, it was in 1995, which is, as you recall, the historic landmarks of 
things happening at the world uh, level, at the global level, was around 1994 with the congresses that, that were held internationally. So their um, presentation says that whether it's political or religious systems, or whether it's unfounded scientific theories, uh, any of these abusive practices are affecting the fabric of the society. And the society that is governed by aggressivity, um, domination by competition, and ruling by force, and those would lead into abusive practices against women. So the more we see that violence prevailing in the society altogether, the more of its impact is sensed and felt on half of the body of the community um, that is dealing with that violence, who are the women. And no matter how much the laws and um, the courts and the government um, will attempt to, to bring laws that will change the fabric of that community and that society, a lot of those old patterns, um, because of the religions that that uh, that accept honor killing, for example, or some of the cultures that force child marriage, um, the the acceptable norms such as dowry killings or um, femicide, and we'll we'll look at some of that in the next few slides, and the fact that the husband owns a wife. It, it, no matter how many laws come into play, those old, deep-rooted norms that are accepted in the culture will be hard to change. So we see some of the things leading to conflict are part of the acceptable norms in the past um, several centuries. Um, the humanity has had to come away from some of the acceptable norms. And we now see that the result of it is in terms of wars, poverty, homelessness, um, not having equal education opportunities, not having equal access to employment, or even when there is access to employment, there is not equality in the pay levels. There is so much that needs to be addressed. And if we were to address one and each individually and separately from the collective whole, it would not take care of the ad and, and address the destruction of that fabric of the society that um, the big picture will, will show us. So let's go to the next um, slide that talks about the female infanticide. This is, again, one of the acceptable norms where women pregnant with a female uh, um, you know, in, in their wombs, they are allowed to, to be subjected to violence in form of killing that child. And if you look at some of the reasons, um, where this lowering of the number of female to male ratio throughout the world is prevalent and nobody's stopping it is mainly due to the profits and to the, to the, large amount of money, and we will see that eventually uh, it leading to sex trafficking, le leading to uh, child bride uh, practices, being a $32 billion uh, industry. That is not going to easily go away um, because of so many forces and dynamics at, at work to keep that um, low ratio and not make a change anytime soon. So again, some of these, the female genital mutilation, um, there are organizations that have worked so hard towards making that one of the reasons where people could flee their countries and come to this country to be allowed um, residency or citizenship based on those type of practices. Um, again, when we talked about that um, killing the female infants, um, and, and allowing the feticide would be a, lot, a leading cause for sex trafficking. And we see that those numbers um, in, in every country, the number of girls missing overall in the world, 100 million girls are missing to feed into that $32 billion. And the numbers are definitely larger. The last time they've done these numbers has been you know, about a decade ago. So those numbers would have to be updated. Some of the countries in the world, however, such as uh, Papua New Guinea, they, they allow some 
progression of the rights of women to become prevalent in their communities because of allowing the, the faith organizations and allowing some of the progressive movements in their country to bring the women's level of education and understanding and participation in decision making to a level that would allow this um, understanding of women's right to penetrate toward, uh, throughout the community. And we see that, the, again, the Baha'i community um, came up with a statement that presented to the government, and it went viral on the social media. And it showed how receptive the, the community and the population was to um, getting that kind of message from the, the organization that issued that statement. And they said that they, they likened the men and women in the world as to two wings of a bird. Um, and both of those wings, although cannot be replaced and used um, to, to function as the other one, they need to complement each other and they need to both be strengthened equally so that this bird of humanity could fly to its highest level of prosperity and strength. Uh, so the world is coming to an understanding that if we shut down and quiet down and silence the 50% of the population of the world and not allow them to be in decision-making roles, that it would affect the humanity uh, at, at large and not just not just women suffer from it, but both men and women and, and the whole uh, world will suffer from it. The statistics are basically numbers, we could find them, but it's mind-boggling that one in three women have to experience the physical violence. So when we look around us, when we are in our gatherings, when we see that some of the people around us are not happy, they're not themselves, they're um, going you know, in, into that dark uh, hole, dark spot, when we ask them to open up, when we offer help, um, we, wanna, we may want to inquire more. We may want to offer our, our loving embrace to, to help uh, because the statistics are just um, offensive and it makes all of us want to do more about it. And although um, men are also the subject of physical violence and intimate partner uh, violence in their lifetime, the numbers are definitely higher for women. And on um, as far as reporting, as far as getting those uh, reported to the police or to the authorities or even to the family members or even to the church, those numbers need to improve if anything meaningful is going to take place to change the fabric of, of this area. Why did we call it love? Ms. Marino did explain a, a bit about that as every one of these abusive relationships We'll start with love. We'll start with a charming individual who will sweep one other person off their feet and will get them to start believing and trusting that that individual is the only one for them. And then after a while, all these uh, abusive practices start. And, and this is from the person that you love. And unfortunately, the reciprocity that needs to exist does not exist. You love them, you trust them, and they don't love and trust back. And therefore, the suspicions get to to increase. Uh, the humiliation uh, is on the rise. The relationships of, of the individual victim is being scrutinized. The relationship with the family and friends are being controlled and observed and monitored. The access to finances becomes um, very difficult. The independence of that individual, if that person has been working and having had some kind of financial independence, all of that is starting to slide away. And the idea of the abuser is that this person becomes so dependent on that abuser that eventually when the level of abuse is beyond emotional and beyond um, the intimacy of the bedroom and gets into actual physical abuse, um, examples that, that the law does recognize, slapping, punching, hitting, biting, uh, pushing, um, and now 
stalking now interfering with their private space in the internet or in their emails, um, their communications being controlled, their um, uh, friendship and uh, association with friends is being controlled. So eventually um, some of that could be threatening to kill the individual, to kill the pet of the family, to kill themselves. The abuser a lot of times uses the love of that victim to have mercy on, on the abuser by saying that if, if you leave me, I will kill myself. So it's either force or it's um, relying on their sense of love and um, compassion. So again, there are some of these um, concepts that have been recognized and all of it has to do with love. Many of the victims, many of the women who are victims have stated that they feel like they, they need to help this person with their illness. So they, they identify the ailment. They identify that something is wrong. Eventually, when they start getting smarter and, and looking into this and realizing that it's really not them that is causing all of this, because that's one of the tactics that the abuser uses is that constantly asking them, see, see what you're making me do. Um, I'm a good person, but you're making me do that. So um, again, this just identifies some of those. I don't want to go into it. But again, everything starts with that love, with creating that, that, that cycle, that vicious cycle. And then all of it is around the, the hopes of the individual that this person will get better uh, because they love that person. They don't really have a true concept of love. They will not be communicating with anyone because it's their choice of a relationship. And then eventually they start losing trust in others because these individuals are so popular and so charming that they have made the victim believe that no one's going to believe them. So, and they are all going to think that this person is a crazy person. So again, they feel that they are more and more attached to, to the abuser and then the abuser denies all of that. And then this is the, the tension uh, building phase. I, I'm hoping that you're all familiar with this and all those who will be visiting our website will get themselves familiar with this cycle if they're not already. That it, it's the reason that it takes several years for a victim to even walk away from that relationship is that they start believing that this will go away or there is a there is a tension building phase and there's the explosion and then the honeymoon phase. The, the abuser comes back sometimes with jewelry, with flowers, with apologies. And then there's a period of time where things are good and then children or the neighbors or friends forget. And then this person starts acting out again. So being familiar with these is very important. Again, those will be available on the website and they're on, on the internet um, in abundance. But it's good to know that the law recognizes a lot of areas of abuse and more and more there is education in the courts about it, the more the, the decision makers and the judges and the court system will acknowledge that these women have not come to court um, because the abuse doesn't end in the, in the home or in the intimacy of the relationship, but it continues in the court system. So if they could not fight back or get themselves saved within that relationship, once they finally split and get themselves on an independence um, road uh, or the road to independence, that they're now being victimized and abused within the court system because it takes money, it takes power, it takes a lot of um, fighting uh, to, to overcome this individual who by the very nature of that relationship is losing power every step of the way. And by the time they get to court, they either have no security financially, uh, no shelter, you know, the, the, the available resources are not sufficient for the number of um, individuals that need those resources. And then, of course, the stigma that is attached with it, the fact that there are children, the fact that the laws necessarily um, do not allow every a woman or every victim with an adult child to be in, in those shelters. And then th th many of them are just facing roadblocks every step of the way, even after they find the strength and courage to step out. And again, this wheel is very famously um, presented in many of the websites. Um, 
and I don't want to go through that. We talked about the economic abuse. Um, some of the ways is to to incur debt, to put the name in the in the spouse's name in the cases that is possible, or the partner's name who is the victim, and then uh, max out the amount of uh, equity and cash out of the equity, and then this individual is stuck with debts, credit cards, the same way. And often in my practice, I've experienced that those cashes that are out of the equity before the transfer of names takes place are used to finance another relationship. There are homes bought um, in places where the United States, of course, may not have jurisdiction um, over the property, and, and the person, again, feels out of luck and out of resources to challenge that abuser in court. The dating relationship, everything that was said about the relationship could be um, amplified and doubly applicable to the teen dating. The numbers are just as bad in the teen dating relationship, often because the young victim is has more tendency to be relying on that one individual who has become the partner. And by that relationship, the victim, the teenager or the young victim, has basically isolated herself out of the relationship with the parents and now does not have the face or the courage to go back and tell them that her choices were wrong. It's also a sign of significance and importance within the youth and within the peer group of that um, victim. And having somebody, a partner of some sort, um, brings them a, a higher level of identity and some kind of significance in their group. And they are sticking to that relationship at any cost. They're not letting go. And it's not often that they could have two or three potential candidates to be their partners. Once they're with someone through the years in high school or in college, it's hard to, to split away and, and exercise your other options, explore your other options and find out if there are other people who could give you a different way of love. Because then that's definite confusion with the concept of love by the teenagers who haven't had too many experiences of experiencing love. Um, with an intimate partner. So as a parent, um, as, a, as a friend, as an auntie, as, an, as a grandparent, as a friend, as a teacher, as a social worker, it's, it's the job of all of us to be familiarizing ourselves with what's going on in the world of our um, children and save those who need to be rescued, even though there is a lot of resistance, um, at least for the first several years of being in that relationship because of the isolation, because of the fact that they have no resources, the, the fact that even a cell phone may not be made available to them or the cell phone may be monitored and the consequences are grave. The punishment and the penalties um, and retaliation by the abuser is so grave that that person may not want to have any communication with anyone. This picture, and I use that for my presentation, I really have issues with, with the understanding and concept of love where a young girl thinks that, you know, I miss him or I love him. And, and that person beats that victim up all the time. There was one quote in one of the international conferences where a Japanese woman, a young woman, was interviewed and she had observed abuse in her in her family from, from her mother being the victim of an abuse. And she had said, no, I have a very good husband. He only beats me once a week. And that was a concept that to her was of a, of a good partner because compared to what she had been exposed to, that was a good treatment. So the statistics about the children, one third of those children who have either been abused or been exposed to abusive relationships uh, or observing their parents, uh, they, they end up being an abuser or becoming abused again in their relationship. So that makes um, our responsibility much more intense and much more important to be watching for all the next generations that will be impacted by the abuse. Some of these pictures are almost unbelievable, but 
uh, not only the love should not hurt the feelings, but it should not be the the reason for any kind of physical violence. And that should be the very obvious sign that, that love has replaced, uh, has been replaced by hatred and there is no room for the relationship. I have another person entering the group here. So again, another very graphic picture. He beat her 150 times. She only got flowers once. So we can't take this lightly. The October uh, month of awareness cannot be about um, people who are either victims or have been very closely connected with the victims. It's about everybody. It's about this vicious cycle that eventually becomes more and more uh, aggressive, more and more violent, more and more forceful, and then often turns into death of the individual victim if they don't save themselves. As some of the models that are being presented to the world, and this is going global, and when we get to the inspiration part, uh, as soon as I'm done with the educational part, we would be looking at some of the ways where the world is responding to this. And the world is addressing the economic disparity, the legal inequality, um, to allow women to find their status and become more self-sufficient so that they can, they can walk away from the uh, abusive relationships. But one of the things that was presented by the, again, the faith community, the international Baha'i community, was that it's not about economic equality or just um, getting the position of equal pay or equal education, although having education will help women get higher and higher in the places of decision making. But it's really the concept of oneness of humanity, the fact that a soul does not have a gender, the fact that every individual, given the opportunity, could prove their capabilities, and, and that comes through service and understanding who we are, understanding the assets that are held within us and need to be polished and brought out to, to flourish. Those are the concepts that the faith communities are now working on. And not only the faith community, but the leaders and the rulers are trying to get into the surface of the understanding and eliminate the self confidence the, the doubt that women um, the victims may have had about their capabilities because they've been told so from the, the time of being brought up in a family who believe that, in a Christian society who believe that, in a faith or religion that um, promoted passivity and um, silenced uh, the, the cry of the individual, and to the laws that were not as effective in helping everyone. So, this is actually a subject that is having to do with um, the title of a presentation, again, the Commission on the Status of Women, uh, called by the United Nations in just the recent years, 2018. A statement was presented by the Baha'i World Community to the, con the, the Commission, and that's where they raised it above um, just bringing women to economic equality or education equality brought them to the point of morally uh, it is unacceptable if we look at uh, gender as a sign of distinction. And we need to bring up the capabilities of every individual and every victim needs to recognize their powers. And one of my friends who has joined the conversation hopefully will shed more light on it after the, in the question and um, answer session on the asset-based way of healing and the victims and um, those who need to recognize their powers through what's within and not what appears to be their material um, possessions. So hopefully that there's a lot more on education that each of us will try to explore and then keep constantly up to date as to what's going on in that field. But inspiration is another goal of the Women and the Move Network and all these empowerment workshops are designed to do. And the 
quote that I found, unfortunately, is cut off on top, is that too many of us are not living our dreams because we're living our fears. And the fact that we should be getting to a point where we would do away with fear. And um, play our role, play our part in the big picture is um, something that I wanted to share through a video that is a three minute video. And that's again, the the United Nations um, presentation of what is being done. And it gives us hope, it gives us inspiration knowing that we're part of a huge movement. We're not alone in this. As they say, we're in it together and we're gonna make progress. So let's see if this helps getting us there. Globally, one in three women and girls worldwide have experienced physical or sexual violence during their lifetime. Less than 40% of them seek help of any sort, and of these, only 10% seek support from police. And of all women who were victims of homicide worldwide in 2012, 50% were killed by intimate partners or family members. This situation cannot be overlooked. And although progress has been made, the end of violence against women and girls is far from today's reality. UN Women is committed to this cause and works with governments, national actors, women's organizations and the civil society to end violence against all women and girls. The international community recently agreed that ending violence against women and girls is an important target for a sustainable future and a crucial matter to achieve the SDGs. During this process, we must make sure that we reach the last woman. By its presence in more than 85 countries on all world regions, UN Women actively contributes to making this possible. We support countries in many ways, including adopting, implementing and evaluating comprehensive laws and policies, addressing the root causes of violence through prevention strategies and working with communities to change the social norms. Ensuring that essential services and support are accessible to all survivors. And collecting data and conducting analysis to fully understand the nature and extent of the problem. UN Women envisions a world where all women and girls are equal and empowered members of society, free of all forms of discrimination and violence by 2030. But let's not wait until then. Let's act now. We need your help and commitment to make sure that we reach the last woman. Together we can make it happen. If not now, when? If not you, who? If not now, when? If not you, who? And this is going to be the call to action by this small organization who's doing its best to get education, inspiration, and empowerment. Every woman or girl that comes to its, um, within its reach. Last time we took a moment of silence to dedicate uh, to the honor of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And as we're talking about change and progression, um, I want us to just pay a moment of silence, not a full minute, but just thinking deep in as we think about our roles. It does not have to be a role that, that somebody like Justice Ginsburg um, took. It, it was a very hard road for her to take. Um, it's our part to play our role, no matter hard. So think about what we can do to play our part. I wanted to share the story of Tina Turner, and I'll, I'll end with that um, song where the love got her in trouble, and when she understood that the love had turned into the abusive relationship, her friends introduced her to Buddhism. And Buddhism and her faith 
as simple and, and, and um, easy those concepts were, it helped her pull herself out of that dark hole that she had in that very abusive relationship. So we see that, that abuse doesn't know limits of power, wealth, and um, that person's status in the community because that person goes into the privacy of their intimate chambers and then they, they could be the victim. Um, I had some quotes from the Baha'i faith because of the empowering um, uh, energy that it produces throughout the, the environment. I wanted us to be learning to just in the habit, getting into the habit of using the scripture, whatever faith scripture we use, use that to empower us, to connect us to the, to the Holy Spirit, to the force of the energy around us. And then maybe with this song, we're just we're repeating that to ourselves. The lyrics are written in this one. You must understand the touch of your hand makes my folks react. That it's only the thrill of boy meeting girl opposites attract. It's physical. Must try to ignore that it means more than that. Oh, what's love got to do? Got to do with it. What's love but a second hand emotion? What's love got to do? Got to do with it. Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? It may seem to you that I'm acting confused. You're close to me If I tend to look dazed I read it someplace I've got cause to be There's a name for it There's a phrase that fits But whatever the reason You do it for Entertainment industry has had a major contribution to the awareness um, of, of individuals and bringing it up to the surface. Um, however, we all have to play our part, and I wanted to just end with a few organizations that are doing things, and you've been seeing some as throughout this presentation, but search and find your place. Um, I don't want to make a pitch for the Women on the Move <laughs> network, but that's a very uh, good start, actually. It's uh, on the local level, doing a lot to empower our, our girls um, and, and women to show them what healthy relationships look like, uh, what unhealthy relationships they should uh, stay away from, and how the friendship and the fun and and the love that comes from those relationships are very different than the love that 
the abuser might use in charming them and trying to isolate them from the rest of the world. So with that, um, I have resources. I will be displaying those on the website of the Women and the Moon, and I will stop sharing because I want to leave room for some discussion. No question answers. I don't have any answers. I just have questions. So. I think the topic and the way that this is approached on a daily basis has uh, become very rich in resources as you're so uh, graciously sharing with everyone. But we know that um, that's, that's not the case. Uh, that it's still rampant. And, you know, I was just reflecting on on this in a class that I was in, and an African-American student started talking about being in a, an abusive relationship. And someone said, so why didn't you call the police? She said, you don't do that. You do not do that. And she she talked about why you don't do that. And it, I mean, it was really eye opening. So I think the more we can have these conversations with friends and particularly, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, of the young girls, how many of, of them have seen parents in an abusive relationship, but didn't know that that wasn't the norm. Doesn't every family experience this? And I, I think that that, for me, is the centerpiece of where we are, is is how to, to introduce this topic to younger girls who don't know to question their family dynamics and the environment in their home. And, and I think that that's where women on the move can play a central role, very carefully, but a central role in, in what they do. Yeah, thank you. That is one of our goals, and especially with our junior high school girls who are just at that age that they're looking around and thinking about relationships of their own. Yes. And it, it's not a topic that we wanted to introduce into our program, <laughs> but we had to because it was necessary. All right. Anybody else uh, would like to comment or have a question? I sort of like uh, Sahela. I've been uh, an attorney for 40 years. And I have seen so much of this and how it's changed in um, the conversation. When the Domestic Violence Against Women's Act passed Congress, um, you finally got a wake-up call for people. They didn't realize that it's not normal to get hit every night. Um, I had one person who was a nurse, and she was having a difficulty with the guy, and she asked the her mother-in-law mother-in-law says what he doesn't beat you every day what's the matter with you it's your fault i had one where the woman was married for 30 years had four kids stayed in the relationship um and the mother-in-law said what well, it's your fault you didn't give him what he needed so he had to go get all those other women and it's okay if they beat you because they only did it once in a while i don't know what, what you complaining about and it goes back to what those people grew up with, um, what their history was, that it was normal. Uh, there was very important progress during this period of time. And there was something called the, the battered woman syndrome, which was attacked because it's not a technical syndrome. But in that battered woman's book that came out, and really called everything into question. People started realizing that domestic is, violence is more than having a black eye once in a while. Oh, I hit a doorknob. Um, there's something more than that. It's hiding, protecting, concealing. I've had people who've been locked in their bedroom while the husband went to work because he's afraid she was gonna have an affair with somebody and she was already pregnant. There were people who were, um, they just don't realize that because he manages all the money, he's the money manager. I'm just supposed to raise the kids and that's it. And that's how my mommy did it. That's how my grandmommy did it. That's how it was supposed to be. No. And in the legal system is very difficult because we have, I had two cases last year. It just about tore me up 
because one of them should never have been granted. It was bull brought by a manipulative woman. And then I had the other one where everything I had, two people come and testify. I had my client testify. All the guy said was, didn't happen, didn't happen. Judge says, well, you haven't sustained your burden of proof, so you know, no restraining order. I'm sorry. I kind of uh, almost had a loss of confidence in the entire legal system over that one case. So what I'm saying is it's not new, but it's people are really starting to realize what it really is. Because anyone who has been subjected to any of the things that are portrayed here uh, knows what it is, but just doesn't realize. And in the battered woman's syndrome, if you will, it's a learned hopelessness. You don't realize that you can do anything. Don't call the police because it won't do any good. They might just arrest you because you hit him first. Um, what, what do we do? What do we do? I can't do anything. And you become so used to it. They actually had a test done when they were writing this book where they talked about a study where they had these little baby rats. And I hate this because little baby rats are still little rats. Okay, They're still alive. They took the, um, the baby rat and put it in a pool of water. It swam and swam and swam and swam and swam and fought and fought and fought before it died. Then they took the baby rat, kept it in their hand, wouldn't allow it to move, wouldn't allow it to do anything. They put it in the tub of water. It fell to the bottom immediately. Didn't even think that it could fight. The conditioning of thinking, you cannot do anything about it. You cannot call the police. You cannot do this. If you call the police, then you're going to have to bail him out. It's going to be legal fees for your for your family. It's going to be miserable. All of the bad advice that you get from the family members who have lived through it themselves, just ignore it. It'll go away. No, it doesn't. It's not COVID. It's not going to go away. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm taking up a lot of time. So I'm just telling you that it's a struggle. It's been a struggle. And it's different now than it was 40 years ago due to people like Sahela and Barbara and moving these things forward. And when you look at it in the United States, it doesn't seem so bad. You look at it worldwide, it's catastrophic. I've had cases in which the Korean boy would go to China to steal a girl because they kill all the children, girl children in Korea. So they go and steal a woman from, from China to take to Korea because they kill babies if yeah. they're girls. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Delilah. It's it's sometimes it's really discouraging, and yet, as we saw, there has been significant progress, at least in this country and in some others. And there's still a lot of work to be done worldwide. I probably have a lifetime that I could share with everybody, but <laughs> as far as this, I mean, there are degrees of. Um, of abuse that we don't look at. And they're also because of learned behaviors on the woman's part, she may be seeing something that's not really there for one thing. And she's reacting to maybe something in the past that she learned. So she has a responsibility as well as the man. And, and most of the time, the woman feels she has no power. But when you work through it, you find out, oh, my God, I have more power than I realized. I could have got out of this a long time ago. You know, but everything's risky. I could just, I mean, I didn't get abused like that. But I could just imagine the girl that was saying, you can't call the police. Well, you can't. You might get beat up worse. You might get killed by your assailer. Yeah. Uh, the police might not understand, you know, because so I could see why she would she would say that. But I think you know, if you want to help somebody, you must have the the uh, the places to take that person. Yeah, so you get prepared. I'll come by at noon, and we'll take you. 
and you get it all set up. And many times she doesn't want to do it when it comes to the bottom line. So we have a lot to learn. Yeah, it's sometimes difficult. Um, I've been in a situation trying to help someone, got her to the courthouse, filled in papers. Um, she, We found a spot for her in a shelter, but she had to get this restraining order before she could go. And I guess there were a lot of prayers going on that day because we were able to snatch the last available appointment hearing with a judge and the judge was a woman. Thank God. (laughs) (laughs) And so we got it and she got her into the shelter and, but it was, and my a mind boggling, mind boggling experience. Wow. Yeah. I had I had one other thing to add. Uh-huh. That it doesn't work just one way. Uh if if a woman has been raised um where the father beat up the mother all this time and she has all this anguish underneath, she can be just as violent toward toward her uh significant other. Mm -hmm. And I had one case in which the guy, uh, they asked him at the trial, um, did you, did you, did you hit her about her weight? Yes. Why? Because she pushed me against the glass window and bumped my head and she was violent toward me and I was defending myself. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's true. And you have to watch it because some people have that explosion inside uh, of having been treated that way or seen it treated in their family and they will explode. Yeah. So it isn't just go one way. There's a lot of domestic violence out there and a lot of it, um, sometimes it's learned behavior. This is what what happened and I'm just going to blow up. So yeah. it doesn't go just one way, but primarily it is, especially in some circumstances in like in, in England way back when, yeah, the, the man owned the woman, um, owned, she had no rights to have any uh, property rights. Uh, everything was belonged to the husband, first the father, then the husband. She was not, she was a non-entity, sort of like the cow that just went along with the, with the process. Um, so we have, have to overcome, as the hell was saying, all of these old, old feelings that the man owns the woman. And what, it was how many years ago before we, we actually got to vote? Yeah, 1921, not so yeah. long ago. A hundred years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's been about 2,000 years. So in the last 150 years, we've, we've made a lot of progress. But um, just wanted to finish my comments by saying that we touched probably just one speck <laughs> of dust and a whole real, you know, field of um, domestic violence or violence against women. And I understand that it could be against men. We did cover a lot of that in the beginning of our conversation, but it will take really years and years for, for organizations like us to be touching the surface of, of this um, old rooted problem. So I hope that we don't think that we've covered everything today because there's so many dimensions and even to start the conversation from different dimensions but that as far as um what this organization can do and i wanted to have my contribution to this organization is that teaching healthy relationships and teaching that uh, oneness of, of all of us and and the fact that it's everybody's responsibility should be what we take home with us that once we help will be empowered ourselves and maybe that'll get us to talking with someone who needs it. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you, Barbara, and thank Sahela and say that honestly, truly, how lucky we are to have uh, somebody like Sahela who takes time and talks to us and uh, discover all of these and bring it in front of our eyes. And uh, I'm sure all of us at one point, we can use the information and it's very, very valuable. But I have a concern and a question. According to the conversation that went on today at this session, uh, you said that there are cases that if women 
call the police, it would make the situation worse. And um, she will be afraid of the more coming towards her. At that situation, even if it is the middle of the night, are there any agencies, other women agencies like shelter places or anybody else, a group, a volunteer group, to interrupt, who you have would have been called at that time instead of the police, call someone to go, for example, two or three more people, go to that home and be there at least uh, when police or until police come. So uh, the situation would be uh, less deniable with the presence of more people being witness or comforting or maybe, maybe a percentage of, you know, uh, scary part to the, you know, abused person, uh, abusing person, abuser. So are they any organizations? There are, but you see, um, Ziba, there are only so many slots, so many beds. And you call some of these agencies and they say, well, we're full. We don't have any space for you. And in many cases, you have to get there on your own. They don't come and get you. Or they will meet you somewhere. So, yes, there are, but not nearly enough. And the thing is, unless you're going to stay out, if you go back home and he is there, it will be hell to pay. Mm. And it happens over and over and over and over again. Barbara, I'd like to address Ziba's question in a different way. Um, it still addresses the same concern. But to get out of a situation, if it is a once in a lifetime, with the example that you said, it, it might be that you will call a relative that will come and get you. But if it is a revolving door where you've been in an abusive relationship for a long time and now eventually you've decided you're going to call the police, you don't do it haphazardly. The shelters, the organizations that are planning the, the rescue they have, they, they have trainings on how to create an exit plan, how to this, you know make plans months ahead of actual day where you're going to be calling someone. Because as Barbara mentioned, once you leave that household, you have to have every plan in place that you will not go back to that man. Mentally, emotionally, psychologically, you have to be done. And then financially, and a place and a roof over your head, knowing that your child is of an age that will be accepted in a shelter. And what if you left in the middle of the night and then the shelter you don't meet the requirement that, that that shelter has, and you're going to have to get back to that person, and now you'll be up twice as three times as much. So, yeah, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of um, wise and careful planning for a while if you are going to make that. Because as I mentioned earlier, that you know they'll abuse you in the relationship, they'll abuse you in the court system, they'll abuse you even when you're done with the court system. And you got to know all of that. And when you're ready, then you're ready to face all of that. And there, needs, and there needs to be there needs to be funding. There needs to be money. There needs to be more places for people to go. Because yeah. like you said, if it's just one shot deal the first time, you may just turn around and go right back to it. And it could get worse. And but when people come to me and they have this egregious story to tell and it's repeat over and over it's a plan you have to have a, a, a landing spot you have to have a place ready um and there needs to be some resources because it's like oh i'm in the house my adult children are here he manages all the finances he hits me all the time the kids try to look the other way i i can't leave i can't take the kids the kids won't back me up because he won't he won't take care of them financially anymore. What do I do? It's a plan and it's a, 
major production, if you will. It takes a little while to do. When you call relatives, relatives are like, nah, they've been through this many, many times. And a lot of them will not assist because maybe they have their own problem just like it at home. It's difficult. We need funding and we need people like these ladies to help us out. Thank you. Jay, did you have something? Well, this whole conversation is just has just stirred me up. So thank you. Um, and and quite truthfully, you know, so much has happened and I lots of things in life have happened. And I was just sitting here thinking, oh my gosh. I used to teach a class at Mount St. Mary's on women in Christianity. And I showed a film on domestic violence in that class because it, it, uh, centered, it centered around religion. And there was an African-American uh, woman who told the story of her husband was a minister, that she would go to church with him on Sunday morning she said, and he would stand there and talk about the love of God, Jesus, and this kind of thing. And then that night, it wasn't uncommon for him to beat her. And how do you leave a minister was, was her question. This is a man of, of faith. But with these two attorneys sitting here, what really came to my mind was in that same film uh, was a woman named Delia. And she was the first woman to get clemency for um, shooting her husband because of domestic violence. Uh, when I was at CGU, we had a conference on women prison and something else. It's been a while. And she was the speaker there. But her husband would beat her. He started sexually abusing her daughter. And one day he came and she got a restraining order and, and uh, it, it, it didn't work. It didn't work. All the things that you guys are talking about, she left, she went to a shelter, he tracked her down. And finally he came home one night and de demanded her to have oral sex with him. And she said, no, I, I won't do that. And he said, okay, that's all right. I'll get her to do it. And it was their 12-year-old their daughter. And she that that's all it took. And she went to the closet where he had his gun. She took the gun out and just shot him dead right there. And she said, her children, she had four children, still gives me chills. She said, I know I'm going to pay a big price. She ended up going to prison. She said, I know I'm going to pay a big price, but I know my children are safe because he is dead. Mm -hmm. And um, so she had some great people around her and got clemency and was released as of that. Yeah. But there was a story about the burning bed. Yes. Same, yes. Same idea. Yes. Yes. I've, I've seen that, seen that as well. And so my point is there's no community off limits on this, you know, uh, and, and as much as, as we can ascribe to religion, it happens even there, so so we can't afford to be uh, have blinders on in terms of how we look at this topic because it hits on all all races, religions, and um, as much as we don't want to think about it, I think I think it's important to uh, have a, a a wide span of of who can fall victim to this. Uh, the same for socioeconomic things. Exactly. Rich, poor, exactly. it doesn't matter. Um, oh, no. It no, no, goes no. all the way through. I, I'm going to take to the board the suggestion that we will do once a month at least a workshop on every one of the root causes of violence because it's beyond the month of October and it's so, uh, per, it's so permeating in the community at, at large that it, it makes violence against women as another acceptable norm because now everybody is, is acting violently. So why are women uh, complain? But then with the economic piece, with the education piece, with the children being used as a pawn um, for the abusive relationship, every one of these components, that's why I said we've touched just the speck in the dust because um, every one of these will deserve 
a day, if not more, of a workshop. So I want us to maybe Barbara and I will work towards getting workshops uh, that that will just focus on on violence and then have discussions around that with professionals such as Jay, such as Delilah, such as all of all of us are professionals. If we had one life experience with someone who's been the subject of any degree, I agree with Edie, and I did say it. it, it gets worse so that the degrees are um some of it is up to us to not let it get to that point point so education allows the the ones who start on the love relationship to not let it turn into violence um and abuse so again so much around it that we've been talking about for, for months and months